This is the OTP pregame presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. When it's crunch time for your health coverage, trust Farm Bureau Health Plans to implement the perfect game plan. With over 77 years of protecting Tennesseans, they know how to win. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, Snickers Hot Seat, Titans Radio's ever-reliable Rhett Bryan. How many of the Snickers are you going to steal on behalf of Coach Mack? Zero. Well, I mean, can we get a shot of this I love Snickers, but I'm not going to do that. It's not as full as it was. It is not as full as it was. The last person was in, who was in here was Dave McGinnis mm-hmm. talking about stealing the Snickers. He clearly and did. And that jar is precariously low. I, are you, I mean, this is a crime. Are you accusing Coach Mack? Of- Straight up, I am. Can I say something? Because huh. this is, this. by the way, this studio is fantastic. Thank you. Thank and you. And with all the cameras and the things that you can monitor, you can probably catch him red-handed with his hand in the Snickers in jar. In the Snickers jar? Well, he said he was going to take the whole jar. I'm thinking about getting some crime scene tape and, and like taping off the area <laughs> and, and dusting a, for prints. I mean, you <sighs> and you could see him taking the whole jar too. Hundred percent, and he put it in his bag with and zero he'd just care. Walk out with seventy-four uh-huh. waters. Mm-hmm. Yep, three hundred and sixty. I think he still grabs a couple of like face masks, like from COVID, whenever he sees <laughs> but them. I've never he seen a, the he Snickers has a mask. <laughs> I think he just grabs a couple every time. Remember, he got, he got a whole box when we left Green Bay we that left time. Green Bay in twenty 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 twenty. Yeah, yeah. to exit. The stadium, you had to go through the <laughs> locker room, and there was a bat, a giant box of masks, and Mac just grabbed the whole box, and we walked out, and he just handed them to me and was like, here, hold these. That's the most empty I've ever seen the Snickers jar in you all know, the time. That, that I, is Coach Mac. Now that I think about it, though, we've only won seven games since he stole all those masks. Oh. I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little, <laughs> little stitious, stitious. <laughs> and I think we need to do something yeah, like do that. Do we need to take those back? Give them back. <laughs> Return Mac. them. Return the masks. <laughs> Return of the Mac. No, that's that's not true. But anyway, uh, good to have you with us, Rhett. I'm glad to be here. The OTP pregame relies on five topics. Okay. And so uh, we're getting ready to go to Buffalo. So the first topic is pretty simple. Give me your scenario how the Titans go into Buffalo and win on Sunday at 12.02 Central Time. Scenario is this. You continue to do what you had done in the last couple of games. Uh, Tony Pollard is a huge part of this in continuing the success with the run game. But if you can somehow mix in RPO stuff and hit on a couple of uh, bang, bang, big down the uh, field type uh, you know, explosive plays, I think that would ignite something in this offense that they're looking for. Defense is playing well for you. Uh, Ryan Stonehouse comes off of a game where he had a 75-yard punt. So you do that and you play clean football and don't turn it over, and I think you can play keep away with those guys and come out of there with a win, but you've got to overcome the atmosphere because, you know, the first thing you said – on the Brian Callahan show this week is they had been there in a month and we know what it's like to show up at Highmark Stadium anyway because it, it those people are outrageous. They're really going to be outrageous multi levels up because it's been a minute. And it's going to be a beautiful day. 66 degrees or something at Ooh. kickoff. It's like prime football weather. Well, I mean every I mean if you're going to the game then you're going to that game. Meaning you're not going to wake up and go, well, it's raining. Or Maybe it's we'll little... tailgate and watch it on TV. Well, yeah, or so. I mean, th- you're not doing that. And people do that all over the league. They want to say they don't. But they do. But you always kind of like it if you're the opposing team and there's something that's happened. You know, it's a little windy or there was rain earlier in the day or whatever because you know it's going to knock just that little edge off the crowd. It, it, not, not happening Sunday. No. It's a I mean, summer day in Buffalo. Well, Chamber of Commerce. And mm-hmm. by the way, the people in Buffalo serious about their tailgating? I wouldn't be surprised if somebody tailgating there right now. <laughs> I'm serious. Just I, I, sitting in their own you're front not yard. Wrong. <laughs> They're wild. RVs, lawn chairs, whatever. All right, so give me your scenario, Amy Wells, of how the Titans go into Buffalo and win on Sunday. 
I think if the Titans are able to handle their own business, and by that I mean play a clean game, limit the penalties, are able to force some turnovers, are able to handle the things that are fully in their control and play a clean game, I think they give themselves a pretty good chance of winning this game. I like a lot of the different matchups, both offensive and defensively. I like just the way these two teams go together. I think it gives a lot of advantage, Tennessee Titans. But uh, you got to play a clean game. You have to handle the controllable things that you can control. And that's penalties. That's takeaways. That's not giving the ball away. That's handling your own business. And if the Titans can do that, I think they give themselves a really good chance. I think it's Josh Allen, largely the story. Josh Allen has not thrown an interception this season. Wow. He is going to throw an interception at some point. How about Sunday? Balls and averages. Well, and, and he has thrown some balls. Troy Aikman said it on Monday Night Football. He said, now he's thrown some balls that could have been intercepted, but they weren't caught. I, I think that's where you start is if you get a chance to have an interception, you got to intercept the pass. The other thing he's done well, th- this is incredible. The Bills are 7 of 7 converting fourth downs. Wow. So they're converting 34% of third downs but 100% of fourth downs. So that takes their conversion rate up to around, well, over 40%, actually, if you add those conversions in. So you can't let them get fourth and ones. You, you can't let Josh Allen be sneaking there and at the goal line, which they use him for because he's 6'5", 240 pounds. The other part of that, along with the conversions, 15 touchdowns in 22 red zone possessions, only five field goals. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you got to make them kick field goals. They're going to move the ball. Guess what? It's going to happen. You stop Josh Allen and you give yourself a chance well, if you do the other things right. I don't think you're going right. to stop him. I, I think you're going you're gonna to hope that you catch it when he throws yeah. it to you and that you force him into situations where their offense has to come off the field without having scored a touchdown. And so so that's the part of it. On the other side, and this is really incredible about them statistically, already this year their defense has 10 takeaways. They've also seen six possessions by the opposition inside their 20 where the other team hasn't scored points. So every time you get down there, you've got to score. Whether that's a field goal or a touchdown, you've got to score. Now, the Titans have actually been very good. Their best offensive statistic to this point is 13 red zone trips, eight touchdowns. Wow. So that is very solid. You like to be over 60%. You'd like to get it to over 70%. But you get down there and the Titans are scoring, score touchdowns, but at least get a field goal. I think if, if that's the game it becomes, if you're if you're getting off the field on defense, catch the ball with Josh Allen because you're going to have an opportunity, and then on the other side, just keep producing. Just keep finding ways to keep grinding points out, whether that's touchdowns or field goals, and stay in this ball game. I think you've got a chance to win because what you said about matchups is correct in that the Bills have had some injury problems. Listen, and and what they've done is such a veteran team style of how they've played this year. They've the the best they could have hoped for coming out of training camp with how the schedule was set through six games was four and two. Guess what they are? Four and two. Because they've they got a quarterback. They got all these veterans. They know how to win. They win the games they should win. I mean, this is really who they are. They haven't been overwhelming for the most part, though. And that's the thing you say, okay, with this defense the Titans have, you've got a chance to match up. Yeah, yeah. But but the game has to go, in my opinion, you know, the, the topic being how do the Titans go in and win – I think these sort of ancillary factors with the chess moves is kind of how it has to go down. Yeah, I think that's strong. That's good analysis, Mike. 
It's Thank one you. of the reasons, too, why I mentioned the run game being a part of this because in one of their losses was Baltimore. They ran all over them. Right. And so they are beatable. But you're right about – now, the going inside the 20 and them not allowing a touchdown or a score, little of that skewed because Greg Zerline missed a couple of, well, of but chip th- shotters. But that's the whole thing is you, you can't get down there – At Brees Hall rushed for over 100 yards. Mm -hmm. They're giving up 140 yards rushing per game in part because they've had had injury situations. But you've got to make the field goals. Right. You know, I mean, if if the Jets make the field goals, they win the game. Uncle Nick, as you call him. Yes, the the, the former Jets kicker who's kicked in Orchard Park more than once, which is one thing you really like about Nick Folk in this matchup is – He's been through the swirling winds, and we've all been down on the field there before. It's a thing. Oh, it's very real. It is very real. I, <laughs> One of my favorite sideline memories is you coming down to me <laughs> during a game and saying, w- is he kicking into the wind or with the wind? And my thought was, who could tell? <laughs> because it really is. It feels like you're just standing in the middle of one of those money things that mm-hmm. shoots the money. The money yep. machine. Yeah. Yep. yeah, because the wind comes from everywhere. And I remember just kind of chuckling and being like, well, I think it's coming from this way. But who really knows? It's everywhere. Right. It's wild. To your point about Josh Allen, I saw the crazy set I saw on him this week, I believe about 40% of his rushes are either for first downs or touchdowns. Mm-hmm. To wow. go back to your fourth down part, wow. Well, he's – I mean, he's amazing. When I saw him at the Senior Bowl, I didn't really know what to make of him because I'd never seen an arm like his ever before, ever. I, I mean, it was – and, and I'm talking about, you know, and, and there have been times where I've snuck down on the field over 20-plus years to go see somebody throw just because you wanted to – or to see somebody kick or catch or you wanted to determine how big somebody really was or how not big they were. Mm-hmm. And when I watched him at those practices, I, I've still – and the Titans quarterback, Will Levis, absolute gun. Mm-hmm. This guy is something to that level and even beyond, and he is so big. He is such a big human. But, you know, when he was at Wyoming, he completed – I'm looking at it here – 56% of his passes. Wow. And, I mean, remember, he had the game a couple weeks ago in Houston where he went 9 out of 30. Yeah. So this offense is set up for him, but they take advantage of what he does well. He runs really well. To Rhett's point, in his career, Rhett, he has 56 rushing touchdowns. Now think about that. He has started 109 games, counting playoffs, and he has 56 rushing touchdowns. I mean, wow. And, I mean, he can run. He can – I mean, early in his career, he had a couple hundred-yard rushing games, but now – He's up to 25 games with 300 yards passing. He's passed for 4,000 yards each of the last three seasons. He hasn't thrown a pick this year. I mean, he's been well coached, and they've stayed with him at different points. You know, last year he threw 18 picks. And it's like, well, that's his game. He's going to have a 9 for 30. He's going to throw 18 picks on a year. But he's so good at the things he does, and when they are able to dictate with him, they don't lose. When you can get in the back and forth game, it's a it's a little different. That's interesting that he – because you're right, and that's where my question mark has always been with Josh Allen is you feel like, I mean, he's got the size, he's got the ability, he's got the skill, he's got these – magnificent games with all of the statistical whatever you want. But then he has some games like Houston, and then he has some games where he's throwing picks all over the place. And and you're just wondering, like, where's the consistency? But I guess that over time, when you zoom out a little bit and look at his career, it's kind of a wash. No, I mean, I think it's better. You think it's better than a wash? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Interesting. 70, 72 and 37 as a starter. Okay, yeah, but, that's better. But what they've said, and this is where McDermott and the GM Brandon Bean have been so smart, 
is they've said, this is our guy. Period. And, I mean, Rhett, you remember him as a rookie. Were you traveling his rookie year? Potentially. Oh, was that the, that was the Nick Williams game? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was. The Nick, yeah. the, we're, we're, That's what's in my mind as you're describing his style of play, and I think about the growth year over year right. since that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he threw for 82 yards. Right. Yeah. He mostly ran. Right. And – that was the whole thing. I mean, they were running. They were running like student body left and things with him. <laughs> but what they've done, I think, as well if not better than any franchise in the league, is they got their guy and they said, "This is our guy, and we're just going to do this, and we're going to build him out." And then the second year, by the end of the second year, he was better. And then by the third year, he's throwing for 4,000 yards. Yep. And we go get him Stephon Diggs and on and on and on. And we have a running game and we play defense. And he can always play in the weather because he's big and he has a great arm. Yes, we might have to deal with 18 interceptions in a season, which some people would consider, oh, gosh, what's happened? And they're like, mm, but he threw 29 touchdown passes. Yeah. And it's like, and we win again. Because we know some it's, – it's like the Bills are so smart because they understand they have the guy that can get them there in their weather situation, with their cap situation, in their division. They've won the division four straight years. Yeah. In their division situation, he matches up with our defense. If we have to hunker down in a game and just run it, run it, run it, fine, whatever, it doesn't make any difference – we're not going to go undefeated, and every once in a while, he's going to do something that's probably not going to help us win. But guess what? He's a two-time Pro Bowl quarterback, and again, the stat, 72-37 and 37 as a starter. We will win more. Two-thirds of our games. Yeah. That's we will what win they're... more with him. Win a lot Period. more. Yeah. But uh, understanding that with his quirks, there are – wins attached to that 100 percent, mike i think because of him yeah i think the oppressive thing about him in 2024 is because due to injuries and a couple other things obviously the trade of stefan Dix, he's done it without a true number one wide receiver ah and that brings us to topic number two topic number two is how does amari cooper factor into the game on sunday he was acquired on tuesday from cleveland And he already has 24 catches on the year for 250 yards and two touchdowns. But we saw Monday night in that game with Khalil Shakir banged up, with Keon Coleman being a rookie, with their best receiver really being Dalton Kincaid, the tight end, they needed to go get him a receiver. They've gone four and two without replacing Stephon Diggs. And now they're getting Cooper at this incredibly cheap price for the remainder of the season. At just the right time. At mm. just at just the right moment. Um, how do you think he factors in on Sunday, Rep, Brian? Well, I'm going to cheat because earlier this week on Titans programming, you mentioned how he'd been traded, and uh, I had forgotten this, but he played against the Titans in Dallas the first game he's traded from the Raiders to the Cowboys, and mm-hmm. he had, what, five for 56 and a score? Five for fifty-eight in a score. Five for fifty-eight but in a very score. Close, yes. Yeah. But His I, first game. And look, you you look at what he's done, and by default now he's their leading receiver at two hundred fifty yards, two touchdowns. But you're talking about a guy. His whole career has averaged almost over fourteen yards a catch. His last two years in Cleveland, over a thousand yards receiving, over seventy catches, and I think fourteen combined touchdowns. And uh, you know he, he can make a difference. He absolutely can. I'm interested to see what they do with him, and certainly he's a vet and can. they'll put a package together for him. But you're right. Khalil Shakir, Dalton Kincaid, those are the two people who have made it work through the first six games this year, and predominantly for Shakir out of the slot. But they do the same thing with Dalton Kincaid a lot as well. Um, Keon Coleman has his place that he can grow, but this is a viable option for Josh Allen. You agree we're going to see a lot of Amari Cooper? I think we are going to see a ton of Amari Cooper. I think that that was, first off, the point. And I think he's something, he is someone that can fit in 
so easily just because of the way that he plays as a receiver. I think that he he's kind of a plug and play guy. Like he doesn't need a ton of reps with their offense. He doesn't need a ton of time in their system to learn what it is. He can come in and just go and make an impact right away. So, yeah, I think that Amari Cooper is going to be a big part of what they end up doing on Sunday. Also, I'm interested to see how they continue to use tight ends because it seems like more and more and more you're seeing you're seeing the tight ends get more involved. You mentioned Dalton Kincaid and what he's been doing. It I'm I'm curious to see if they're going to be a part of this or if this is going to be the Amari Cooper show. What I'm interested in with them at tight end is do they and can they get Dawson Knox more involved? It, you know, because Dawson Knox has been to a Pro Bowl. Yeah. But Kincaid is now the focus. I mean, K- Kincaid had 73 catches last year as a rookie. So do they use Dawson Knox or is that a chip that they use – you know, down the line, looking at a, a trade possibility as we get closer to the trade deadline on November 5th, because he's a really good player. Mm-hmm. Caught a touchdown the other night. Yep. Um, he's a really good player and still a young player. Good athlete. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Good athlete. And that's what scares you about how they, when he's in the game, you think, oh, well, now in their offense, he's the fourth option. But is he really? I mean, he's certainly way better than a fourth option in terms of his talent. And thinking about Amari Cooper now in the mix, to your point, kind of what they do with tight ends, what does this do for some of the other receiving core if as targets are shifted? Like, what does it do for Mac Hollins Mm -hmm. in this offense? Mac Hollins, who had the best game of his career against the Titans in September of 2022 when he was playing for the Raiders. Eight catches, 158 yards, and a touchdown. Didn't do as much last year playing for the Falcons against the Titans. Two catches for 27. But he's another big veteran receiver who caught a touchdown pass on Monday night football. I want to go back to Amari Cooper for just a second, though. I I made the comment earlier this week, and I meant it, that I think of all the receivers who could have been traded to the team the Titans are going to play this Sunday – He's the absolute worst Oh, in terms of worst for the Titans. And what I mean by that is this is a guy, when he's coming out of Alabama, he's compared stylistically to Marvin Harrison because he's just – he's he's always open. He can run the entire route tree. He has speed. And quietly, his NFL career has been like that. Yeah. you you Because he's been traded three times – it's almost as if he's judged as less than, well, get this, five Pro Bowls, 7,000-yard seasons. He's on the cusp of 700 catches, and he's still just right at 30 years old. Doesn't it feel like he ought to be like 45 years old? Yeah, I he's feel like he minute. should be older than that. It's like Brandon Cooks. Yeah. Well, Brandon, also multiple trades. Yeah. yeah. He holds the record with Eric Dickerson having been traded four times. Brandon wow. Cooks does. Huh. But. Do you remember when Amari Cooper came into this building Mm -hmm. in 2015? For a pre-draft visit. For a pre-draft visit. Oh, yeah. And what was interesting about that year is that was the quarterback's year. Yep. Yep. And so it was either going to be Jameis Winston or Marcus Mariota or Leonard Williams, Mm -hmm. who's gone on to have a super career. Is a is a perennial Pro Bowl type defensive lineman, and then Amari Cooper. Yep. And to us internally, he was always the sleeper of the group. If we got out at number two or we moved back a spot or two, Rustin Webster really liked him, and we all really liked him. Most people thought of the four guys at the top. There's a very good chance he would end up being the best player, which he has, in terms of his accolades and his production. No disrespect to Leonard Williams, who's also been good. But just the consistency factor of the Marvin Harrison comparison. And, Rhett, we did these interviews, and we put them out there. And that was by design. Yeah, yeah. We we wanted people – Little smoke screen. Mm Mm-hmm. I think it was. Is that, yeah, I mean, it, 
it was more wanting people to understand that we were doing the whole the, thing. The, the complete due diligence. We mm-hmm. were doing we weren't just saying we're taking this quarterback and this is it. We were assessing every option of right. what that first round could look like. Was my my thought or my understanding I, I right. of what we were being asked to do was to show that the Titans were were pursuing every avenue. But I do think there's some smoke screen to it. I think oh, you for sure. you said it well there. It wasn't just smoke screen. Mm-hmm. But you wanted the Titans, you wanted everybody think cuz Tampa was taking Winston. They had yeah. to take Winston. He played at Florida State. He's from down that way. I mean, you know, he's he's from Birmingham, Alabama. I mean, that that's what they're doing. It all fit. They are taking Winston. Jameis Winston is going to Tampa. That's it was the worst kept secret in the world. We were really the number one pick. Yeah. In in terms of the unknown and will the phone ring and this. Well, when when it came time to interview Cooper, we were told good luck. Yeah. He doesn't talk. And we found the thing he likes to talk about. And that is playing receiver. And we're going to show you a clip of this, which will make you understand from from nearly 10 years ago why he will be ready to play this Sunday. He got it then. He's proven over the last nine-plus years. He's done that. And even nearly 10 years later, you can bet he gets it now. This is a a little bit of the conversation with Amari Cooper from his pre-draft visit in 2015. The precision routes, that's something you have to work on. That's not natural. Hands might be natural. Leaping ability, speed might be natural. But the routes and running the routes in such a way that you can't tell what Amari Cooper is going to do. You change speed so well. How did you develop all of that? Uh, I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I've played receiver every year that I've played football except for one, one year when I was smaller. And I started playing. Uh, third grade, but I've been playing. Before I started playing organized football, I was still playing football, running routes out there. So it's kind of an uh, innate. Uh, I can read the the body language of the defender and know when I got him. So yeah, I'm just I'm just blessed that I'm able to do those type of things. You're a student, obviously. Obviously, who have you studied to watch moves and different accelerations and things of that sort? Uh, well, I, I don't really. I don't really study a lot of other receivers. Uh, it's just when I was growing up and the coach wanted me to run a slant route or an out route, I had already been doing it in my backyard without knowing I was doing it. So when he showed me how to do it, I was already really able to do it. So I don't know. I'm just, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's amazing because most people, when they start playing in the backyard, they want to be the quarterback or the running back. What made you want to be a receiver and take that so seriously? Well, um, so my after school, my after school camp, we played at the barnyard every day uh, after we finished our homework. And you know, you, you're right. Every, everybody wanted to play running back. The counselor played quarterback. So I would line up in the backfield. But since everybody wanted to play running back, he one day he told me to go at receiver. And uh, after I went at receiver, I just enjoyed the process of catching the ball because I really didn't know how to catch at first. I would always catch with my chest. So it was kind of a challenge to catch it with your hands. And I would catch it and be so satisfied with catching the ball that I would always just stop. He would say, no, you have to run after you catch the ball. You have to try to shake the defenders. So I think I think that's what made me start really liking receiver. It was a challenge for me. The guy always wanted to play receiver. Yeah, his whole life. That's his thing. He and know, he and the route tree. I mean, The he, whole thing. He yeah. knows it. Just give him, give him a package and let him go. So, if you were discussing as we were Tampa and how in 2015 they were definitely going to take Jameis Winston, which they did, the best non-secret of this week is that Amari Cooper is going to be ready to play for Buffalo against the <laughs> Titans. Yeah, yeah, he's good. The, Don't worry about it, guys. The problem with the Amari Cooper story, too, that is uh, so difficult at this moment. Last year, his best game of the season for the Cleveland Browns was against? The Tennessee Titans. Tennessee Titans. Seven catches, 116, including a 43-yard touchdown. Hmm. It's also the best day Deshaun Watson has ever had as Browns quarterback. 
Yeah. Why hmm. why is that? I don't know. I don't know, but I don't like it. Yeah. So there's that. Hmm. Hey, Titans fans, with a Kroger Boost membership, you'll score big with double fuel points, free delivery, and lots more. Go to Kroger.com slash boost for details. Kroger, official grocer of the Tennessee Titans. Tighten up. Home is at the forefront of all that we do. It's why we're so committed to caring for the places and spaces in which we work and live. Ashley, the official furniture provider of the Tennessee Titans. The OTP pregame continues with topic number three, and that is Jamal Adams has been waived by the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Did not play a lot of football for the Titans, certainly. Um, Disappointing it didn't work out, but I I don't think a total surprise to anyone internally, externally. No, I don't think so. I think that this was a situation of – wanting to find a veteran player to be in that secondary. I think that that was what it was. It, I mean, didn't break the bank bringing him in here. At all. Very reasonable amount of money spent. It was one of the – it was kind of a flyer. You know, you you throw it out there. You see he seems really interested in coming here. He seemed very excited about the program and what the team was trying to do. And as things kind of evolved and the pieces kind of settled into place and, you know, you you kind of figure out who's who in the zoo and where everything fits together. And it just didn't feel like the right fit anymore. And, you know, he's had a long career. He's had injuries. He's kind of in a unique set of circumstances of his own. And so, I mean, yeah. Is anybody really surprised? No. Do I think it's a huge hit to the defense? Not really. I I think this is just one of those things where hopefully the two sides can kind of part ways and and that's that, you know? The, I mean, we've seen so many people come and go over the years for myriad of reasons. I mean, I think about just not that long ago in training camp, Sadiq Charles was the talk at right guard. And then he up and retires one day. It happens. Things happen. You're right about having a safety for this defense because with the defense that Denard Wilson uses, Amani Hooker is the mainstay, and then there's a rotation sometimes with that other spot. You know, and they it wasn't too long after they did the Jamal Adams things, they did Quandre Diggs. They did so. I I think between having bodies and just trying to work out guys, vet, veteran presence though in the secondary, I think was one of the main objectives. Well. Elijah Molden was not going to be the fit for this defense, which is why they traded him to the Chargers, and he's doing fine there, which is not surprising. He's a good football player. But they were looking for veteran presence, so they they went looking for Adams to add him as a veteran presence. I don't know. Maybe they got digs in some part because of his friend Adams being here. And it's possible. And and it's worked out great. Yeah. But that was what – Denard Wilson wanted he wanted more veteran to put with Amani Hooker. So, you know, what you got, Adams was inactive at Chicago, made one tackle against the Jets. He started the Green Bay game and made three tackles. He played as a reserve at Miami, and then he was placed on non football or reserve non football injury. Um And that was done on the 12th, so that was done on Saturday, I guess. He did not play in the Indianapolis game. Um, Where he is at this point in his career, um, he actually, as we tape this, turns 29 today. Oh, happy birthday. So um, he's a free agent and able to, to go somewhere. And I think the other part of this that, is important, maybe not as much to wins and losses, is sometimes you want to do right by a veteran player as much as possible. If it's not working, which it's not, then let him go. Yeah. Then then give him a chance. I mean, how many more years Jamal Adams has, I don't know. He's a guy who was very hard on his body because of how he hit people, and he's a pro. He certainly made some money. He's been a big name. If he gets a chance to land somewhere where he can do something for the rest of the year that gives him a chance to, you know, win a championship or or be nearer family or 
you know, in a system that can use him, you know, agents certainly are aware of certain things. Other players, veteran players are aware of certain things. It does not hurt you to be professionally positive in that way. Mm Mm-hmm. You want to give him the opportunity to find whatever situation works better for him than where he currently is. It doesn't do anybody any good to keep a player in a situation where it's clearly not working. Rarely does either side benefit from that. No, and I mean, if you were in a situation where financially it would be of good benefit to you to have the player on the team or what you know on whatever list they're on or to trade them or to do whatever that's one thing but this deal was so team friendly yep that that which is why they took the flyer in the first place financially they lost almost nothing yeah and so they took the flyer it didn't work and then rather than continue on with it they part as much friends as you can and allow him to go on and do what's best for him that's the way you hope it goes. You, I, I think doing right by the player is a, is a big deal or is a bigger deal than probably what we know on a day-to-day basis. And I also think that it's an important reputation to establish when right. you have a young staff. So when you have a new head coach, when you have a second-year general manager, when you're in a position where – this group as a staff is still establishing its identity within the NFL. I think to be able to point to future free agents, to be able to point to your own guys to say, listen, this was a situation where we wanted to do whatever we could to take care of the player. I think that goes a long way, not only within this building, but throughout the National Football League. Both of your points valid, because that's what I'm thinking the whole time we're talking about this. It also cements uh, the very positive uh, reputation that Rand Carthon and this staff has. Like he, you know, he's still new in this as the general manager, still, you know, new in this window of time. And these players and agents talk to one another all the time. And I, I think when you have that look, that, okay, you know what? Tennessee must be a cool place to play, that must be a really good outfit. And uh, whether that pays something down the road in a dividend, you never know. But, yeah, that's good business is looking out for the player first. Well, the other part that you have, too, that you didn't feel like you have coming out of camp is you, you're you obviously more interested in seeing some Julius Wood at safety. Julius Wood is a player that the Titans claimed off of waivers um, out of Dallas on August the 28th. He played special teams at Chicago, and then he was inactive for the next three games. Well, then the situation happens where on Saturday they go ahead and put Jamal Adams on reserve non-football injury, and here's Julius Wood getting a chance to play against Indianapolis. So now, at this point in the season, not only have you established where you think you are with Jamal Adams, which is just not there, you're also saying we have the confidence to give this guy more of an opportunity. I mean, that's how it looks at first blush to go with Mike Brown as the backups behind Quandre Diggs and Amani Hooker, and let's see what this guy can do. You know, you, I, I think you've got to have that sort of feeling in your mind. I mean, because while you want to do things for good reasons – Right. You you want credibility and you want to be kind. It's still about winning football games. Right. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You wouldn't do this if you didn't feel like you're okay at another spot and or you want to see more, not necessarily at safety. I don't think Julius Wood's going to play safety. I guess they feel like he could if need be now more so than he could a month ago. But – Let's see this guy on teams. Mm-hmm. Let's see him get after some people. Let's see how he fits in the 48 on game day. Let's let's take a look. We know what we got in Mike Brown. He's a good special teams player. He's played some safety at different points. Now let's see where Julius is. Uh, Julius, um, while he's not Jamal Adams in terms of career, he, he, much younger uh, and, and a chance to work himself into this thing, had a chance to – hang out with him a little bit earlier this week. Uh, he was one of the players at a, 
uh, Play 60 school show that we did with T-Rack. And uh, nice young man. Kids loved him. He had a great message. Uh, he's a good size dude, too. He is. He has. He's a long size. player. Well, and the, these are the guys. You know, when you go, Jamal Adams, Julius Wood, you know, a guy who was a high number one pick and a three-time Pro Bowler, All Pro, to a guy who was not drafted. Nobody's saying they're the same player, no. but where the Titans are right now, you're looking to build out this. 48, this 53, this 69-man roster trying to figure out how to get the pieces in place so that next offseason you don't have to turn over 30 roster spots. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, here's his background. He's originally from Columbus, Ohio. Julius Wood did not generate any college interest coming out of Walnut Ridge High School. He opted to attend Blinn Junior College in Brenham, Texas. His two years in the JUCO ranks offered the opportunity to grow both physically and he blossomed into a run-stopping safety presence. He then transferred to East Carolina, 174 tackles, five pass deflections, four interceptions in two years for the Pirates. He ran 4-6 at East Carolina's Pro Day on March the 26, 2024. So he's a rookie. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? I mean, that's, an, that's initially where you go. All right, topic four. Who's your Titan for Sunday that you got to see? Who's somebody? You can't say Tony Pollard. Who's your <laughs> – What? Okay. You were going to say Tony Pollard. Yeah, why can't I say – Because we've established – but Tony Pollard's got to play well for the Titans to have a chance. I don't like these rules, but okay, continue. But we'll let you start. No, I don't want to start. Well, let Rhett start. Let Rhett start. Who's the player you got to see on Sunday that if we're talking about a Titans win, he's had a good day? Will Levis. Okay. <laughs> I want I want Will Levis to lead this team and do this. Uh, I think it would be a shot in the arm for him, a shot in the arm for this team and his teammates. And I think um, a good day for him and a win would be just what the doctor ordered. Okay. I can't say Tony Pollard, but he can say the quarterback. I, I, hmm. Interesting. That's all right. Um, my person well, is. I thought Jeff- it was an obvious answer. It's a great answer. It's a really good answer. Hmm. Um, I think my person is Jeffrey Simmons. I want to see Jeffrey Simmons be the disruptive presence that we know he can be. Um, we've. Uh, obviously understand that he's had some injury issues and he's trying to overcome all of that, but it it's go time, Big Jeff. I need to see you get after it. I'm staying on defense with Ernest. Ernest. Ernest Jones. <laughs> the fourth. <laughs> I just think in this game, with the way the quarterback's going to run and with what they're going to want to do with their run game, especially, God, did Ray Davis look good the other night for the Bills? Ray Davis mm-hmm. did a fantastic job. Well, he had 97 yards rushing, he had, 55 on he, he receptions. He had 152 scrimmage yards. Yeah, That's a lot. He played great. Uh, I'm guessing they'll get James Cook back. They got Ty Johnson. They got the quarterback who can run. I mean, they do things with Curtis Samuel. You're going to have to try to plug that up. Yeah, and, y- you know, you, you're going to have open field situations – on even pass rushes with Josh Allen. (laughs) I mean, he drops back and somebody's coming at him and he jukes the first guy on a blitz. Ernest Jones is going to have to win some against Josh Allen because he'll have some chances. Kenneth Murray will too, but it just feels like this is a game where Ernest Jones could be a big factor. All right, final topic. What's bothering Amy Wells? So many things. Your rules to your games, right off the there top it is. of my head. There it is. Okay. No, I have other things. Of course, there are things that are bothering me. Can I, can I offset it with a nice thing too? This feels kind of like a negative point. Can I do like a negative and a positive? Well, sure. Okay. So here's the thing: things that are bothering me. For starters, did you guys read this article about how the owners can't decide if they want to allow video on the sidelines? Have you guys been Is keeping up with Is that from the Atlanta this? meeting? Yeah, from the Atlanta meeting. And it's always been swirling. It's been swirling since 15 or 16. Okay, so let me stop for a second. They had the owners' brief fall meeting in Atlanta on Tuesday. They did. And 
Jacksonville got approved for their stadium. They did. Atlanta got approved for Super Bowl 62. Sure did. And then there were some other ancillary topics. Yeah, and so this is a topic that is not new. It's a continued conversation, and these owners just cannot decide whether or not, and head coaches too, I should say, cannot decide whether or not they want to allow video on the sidelines during games, the All-22 video, in place of pictures. This specific article that I read, there were cited situations where a coach really went after a player for missing a block because that's what he saw on the picture. But when he went back to the tape, that's not at all what happened. He made the block just fine. The picture just caught an odd angle or a weird movement. And so they're, they're can I very... Just, yeah. Can I give another quick clarification? Please. So the pictures... Are on the tablets. They're on the tablets now. They used to be literal pictures Off that were printer. that were run down from the press box, mm-hmm. and then technology got really special, and they could print them on the sidelines. Yes. And so everybody thought, oh, my goodness, we're basically the Jetsons riding on those. <laughs> what this they, is the future. This is the future. Well, then they got moved to tablets. So we're still looking at pictures. We're still making <laughs> yeah. we're still making pictures. Yeah. And they're trying to decide, even though the video <laughs> is available. Whether or not they should whether allow or not it. it should be allowed for I mean, why does it matter? Here are the two arguments. Okay. Let me tell you, Mike Keith. Go and this competitive is, advantage. This is, and this is what's getting my goat a little bit. Here, here, let me explain. So the two sides are one side that says if you are not a good enough coach to be able to look at the game on the field, and the pictures that you are given, the still shots, and deduce what needs to happen in game, You, it, it's your own fault. You're terrible. You need to learn how to do this better. <laughs> a good coach is able to do that, and that is one of the key differentiators between a good coach and a great coach is the ability to see, analyze, and adjust as it's happening in front of them. The, so they shouldn't need video. They sh- you should not require – this is the dumbing down of the coaching profession okay. by giving everybody video. It makes everybody a little bit stupider, and you don't need to work harder to figure it out. Could you even tell she's married to a coach? <laughs> nah. Uh-huh. You would never nah. know. On the opposite side is a notably younger generation of coaches – saying if everybody is able to see what's going on and deduce it as it's happening based on the video, don't you have to be a better coach schematically because everybody oh. is seeing what's going on. So the level of coaching is now how are you able to adjust to the chess game and figure it out? I think that this is such a silly conversation to even be having. If you have the ability to have the technology to make a game better, better for both sides like this is not it's not like only the home team gets to see the video everybody gets to see the video everyone has the ability to make the adjustments to continue to like make a better game because all of a sudden everybody's able to adjust and so uh, everybody wins when video is involved I think I I understand and I'm the first one to want to preserve the integrity of old school football in every possible way. I like it big and mean, and I like it dirty, like in the trenches where everybody is just a ugh, like old school football is what I like How is in that the again? snow. Ugh. Like I like aggressive, just like run it down their throats football in the snow and the rain and the mud. I get it. But give these people video. Like, do the right thing here. This this is a such a non. So you want a caveman's game with technology? But yeah, I want a caveman's game. But let's all be able to watch it at the same time you know and figure out what's going on. You know, it'd be so proud of you right now. Who? K. S. Bud Adams Jr. <laughs> because Mr. Adams made the greatest argument for replay in the late '90s that there was. It was so Mr. Adams. It was succinct. It was on point, and it was easy to understand. Yeah. He said, and Rhett will remember this as I do, when they decided to do replay, there were a lot of people who said, let's go damage the integrity of the game. It's going to make eight-hour games. It's never going to work. It's terrible. You know. <laughs> and Mr. Adams said, and I'm paraphrasing, 
He said, if we can fix something, why wouldn't we do that? If we can make it right, why wouldn't we do that? Hello? And it makes so much sense. Hello? I mean, and, but people, you, 25 years ago, people were arguing this vociferously. And it's like now you really wouldn't find anybody who would say. Get rid of replay. Right. There's, well, there's, ne- there's been no big move for get rid of replay. Yeah. M- Mr. Adams was a big proponent of replay because of something that happened to the Oilers sure. in an AFC championship mm-hmm. game. Yeah, with Don Orr. The and for, the former was that official. Mike Renfro? Mike Renfro. So there was that. But that is that example of what you're talking about with Mr. Adams is exactly why he's currently in a top 25 list for a contributor uh, category to be a 2025 Pro Football Hall of Famer because he had those ideas. He had those things that he lent to what, the like game. Start a new league? <laughs> yeah, yeah what, that's what, a good like, one. <laughs> what, like, steal the best players from the other league so we can be better? What, like, um, oh, I'm not afraid to make Warren Moon the face of my franchise when some people don't want to step forward with a black quarterback? That's silly. Guess what? He's really good. But yeah. had the vision I, to go, hey, why you we're going to get Joe Namath right. in our – in our league, and I know he's better off in the New York market. Right. Yep. And without that, there is no guarantee with Super right. Bowl three. Yeah. You can't have the modern day NFL story without Mr. Adams. In it, it. It's yeah. ridiculous. He's not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. Agreed. That's just me. So well, it's also anyway. me. Anyway, so that's what, what else his is that bothering? was. No, that was what was bothering me. But I also want to hit a little bright spot because okay. this doesn't all have to be about what is not doom bothering and Amy and rage. Things that are making Amy a little happy, okay, a little joyful. Uh, did you guys see that J.C. Latham donated seventy five thousand yeah. dollars to uh, hurricane relief? Yeah, not only in tennessee and the places that needed in tennessee and the carolinas but also in florida florida and he went to img in bradenton which is really hard hit by yeah. both storms it's sort of the tampa area yeah where- it's right outside of tampa and i just thought that for a young player to so early in his career recognize the platform that he has and the impact that he is able to have in other people's lives and to proactively want to do that. Nobody asked him to do this. No. He sought it out. And I I just think that that's such an incredible thing. It's an awesome thing to see out of any human, let alone somebody who is so new in their career, somebody who's so new to having this platform, this paycheck. There's a lot of things about just him as a person that have been so impressive to all of us in he's the first part of his rookie year. Twenty one. Yeah, he's twenty one years old. But look at look at the way that that twenty one year old human has just impacted so many people's lives, and it has nothing to do with football. And it's not because a single human told him to. First I just of, think it's incredible. It is fantastic. First of all, a servant's heart. He's mm-hmm. got it, no mm-hmm. question. How many conversations have you had with J.C. Latham? Multiple. Yeah. Few. He's a very interesting person, and he is very wise mm-hmm. to be 21 years old. It's incredible. If that's me at 21 years old, you go, this guy's a jack. Yeah. I mean, good grief. Yeah, but same. he is – I really – I had a lengthy conversation with him yesterday in the locker room, and um, I came away so I've, – I've been impressed since he walked in the door, but golly – so the fact he did that, not a huge surprise. Yeah. I think as the franchise comes out of the wilderness, which will happen, I mean, it's going, it's going to happen. It, it doesn't feel like it right now. Uh, but if you've been here, if you were here in 2004 and 2005 and the start of 2006, if you were here 2009 through 2015, sometimes it takes longer than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's going to take that long. No. But th- this franchise is going to come out of the wilderness, and you're going to look back at things that happen that you really don't want to hear about right now because you're in the wilderness. But one of the things you're going to look back on and be thankful for is that the Titans took J.C. Latham at number seven. Yeah. Yep. Not not referencing any other player that they could have taken, that everybody you know would would have been fine. I'm just saying – 
for where the franchise is, for what their need was at tackle, for who the human being is, for how he's going to be a good player for a long time. I mean, there are several things that are happening that are positive that aren't reflected upon because, again, wilderness, t- wilderness, <laughs> and and that's okay. And and we, you know, we understand. You know, it's not just now; it's the last two years combined. And I mean, it's a thing. But you will look back and you will say, "This was a really good thing." Picking J.C. Latham for this entire organization was a really good thing. He's going to be a cornerstone piece of this he foundation. He will be a cornerstone piece of the foundation for a long, long time. On yep. and off the field. Well, that's yep. the point. For mm-hmm. the for the organization. Right. Yep. I think it's well put. Anyway, that's what's bringing me joy. Hey, Titans fans. SeatGeek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be a part of all the touchdown celebrations this season. Whether you're buying or selling football tickets, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek is the official primary ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing? A ticket that works. Expect the expected. SeatGeek. SeatGeek. <laughs> Made a rookie mistake this football season? Maybe you should have had a Snickers. Because now you can enter for the chance to turn those rookie mistakes into prizes, including a trip to Super Bowl 59. Visit snickers.com slash rookie mistakes for details. Rhett, thank you for being here. I'm and glad. This mm-hmm. studio, by the way. <laughs> hey. Isn't, isn't it fancy? Isn't it nice? Coach Mack is trying to get it named after him. Not if he keeps stealing our candy. Yep. Big we, surprise that he's trying to do that. Hmm. But we've got a couple things we have to do. Will you bear with us? Go. Okay, <clears throat> so we need you to be a model for us. Mm-hmm. So he's got the Little Caesars. It's time for the key ingredients of the game delivered by Little Caesars. The Titans got their first interception last Sunday, but they didn't get any quarterback sacks. So this Sunday in Buffalo, let's do both. The Titans' defense isn't giving up many yards, but they need more big plays. Key number one, the Titans' defense gets after the quarterback and creates turnovers. Key number two, keep Tony Pollard's momentum going. Tony Pollard has a grand total of 181 yards rushing in the last two games. The Memphis product has been the Titans' most consistent weapon so far, and he's getting stronger. Maintain the Tony Pollard momentum. And finally, the Titans have to clean it up. Cut the penalties, cover punts, catch the catchable passes. Don't miss chances to make a big play on offense, defense, or special teams. The Titans have lost three one-score games that have all had their winnable moments, but the Titans didn't play clean enough. That needs to change Sunday in Buffalo. You did that in 47 seconds, but I spotted you some. So, anyway, Little Caesars is the official pizza partner of your Tennessee Titans. Download the Little Caesars app and get your favorites delivered today. Delivery fees do apply. It's time for a mayo tovation from Hellman's. May your Titans cheers be loud and your buffalo chicken dip make you, your mama, and everyone in the entire family proud. Hellman's, the official mayo of the Tennessee Titans. May your game day be delicious. Make your mama proud. 11 o'clock Central Time Sunday. This guy, this lady. Yes. Brad Willis, Ramon Foster, Coach Dave McGinnis, and a cast of thousands. (laughs) Titans Countdown, presented by Farm Bureau Health Plants, which also sponsors... The show. OTP. Yeah. 11 a.m. Central on your favorite Titans radio station, including 104.5 The Zone in Nashville. For Rep. Brian and Amy Wells, Mike Keith thanks you for joining us for the OTP.